Oh, yes. oh yes, when people, when people talk, talk about, about how science fiction writers predict the present, it's because, it's because they've gone they've through a large corpus of work and picked out certain things. things. Uh, we can't yeah, just predict. predict. There isn't enough story material in straight prediction. We make up futures. It doesn't matter whether we really think they'll come to pass or not, but we ask ourselves only, will this be interesting to deal with? Will this make a nice story? And then if some of them do come true, well, good. I think you wrote an essay called uh, Flight, uh, called Escape uh, from fantasy to characterize what you thought the essence of science fiction was. Most people think it's a flight into fantasy. I think the title is Escape to Reality. Escape to Reality, I'm sorry. Right. Well, that's because, you see, when you think of the future, you try to make it as plausible as possible. Back in 1933, for instance, there were science fiction stories dealing with a world in which all the oil and coal had been burned up. Well, the youngsters who read that story in 1933, including myself, uh, took it seriously, at least I did, and I said, my goodness, what happens if we do burn up all the oil and coal? That's the first time that ever occurred to me that this might be a problem. So that, on and off, I worried about using up our fossil fuel supplies for the last 40 years. And most of the world, virtually all the world, has only started worrying about it a few months ago, you know? The imagination of science fiction writers is certainly limited. Well, that's true. Uh, back in 1848, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story set a thousand years in the future, in 2848. And in it, he had uh, transatlantic aeronautical voyages, only in balloons, going a hundred miles an hour. In other words, in his day, there were balloons. So his vision of the future was of faster balloons. If a New Guinea native thought of a future in which you could uh, communicate between continents, he'd think of very loud drums, you see. It's very difficult, really, to visualize the real future. But then, you see, in science fiction, you're allowed to depart from scientific possibility, provided you know that you are departing from it and can explain it. The reader will go along with you into the realm of fantasy if you will give him an excuse. But to do it without realizing you are going into fantasy is insulting to the intelligent reader. Book upon magazine, article upon book, uh, would seem to be in some kind of race. Well, I'm not. It, it seems so, but it isn't so. Actually, what it amounts to is that I'm not happy except that I'm writing. It's the only way, it's almost the only way I can think of to spend my time pleasantly. And so I'm naturally drawn to the typewriter at all times. The day is lost in which I don't type. Deadlines hold no terror for you? No, because I, I know that if I have an article to write, I can generally write it without trouble whenever I sit down. So if there's an article that must be written within, say, two weeks, as there happens to be one, I'm not concerned because sometime before the two weeks is up, I'll sit down, and whatever day I sit down on, by the end of that day, the article will be written. A colleague of yours once said that if he read all of your book, he wouldn't have time to write any himself. <laughs> well, it's reversed in my case. Considering how much I write, I'm having very little time in which to read anyone else's. I think it's a book, a, uh, a book a month? For the, for, the last, last, for the last four and a half years, it's been a book a month. I mean, it's not something I've set myself as a goal. I just worked it back, and I said, my goodness, it's a book a month. Uh, Dr. Asimov, uh, most people, when they think about the future, uh, try to reach out to uh, the year 2000. Let's try 500 years from now. What kind of planet do you see? One of two, depending on what happens by the year 2000. If by the year 2000 we have not solved the problems that face us today, then I would say 500 years we'll see a world containing a technological civilization in ruins in which there will be a relatively small number of human beings uh, sort of surviving and with New York City as the most magnificent ruin in the history of the human race. And the other? If we succeed, if we succeed in solving our problems today, then 500 years now we can well be living in a kind of utopia, a world with a relatively small population 
uh, carefully has to use their resources with a working colony on the moon and perhaps on Mars, reaching out to the entire solar system, taking advantage of advances in technology we now can't even imagine, living under conditions which, when they look back on the present, they will be horrified and wonder how we could have survived. Thank you, Dr. Asimov. I am Simon Borgman.